us. This is our tribute that we provide to Dr. Martin Luther King. Um, we are soon after the celebration of, of his birthday and his contribution to the nation. Um, and so we thought that it was really the most appropriate thing to bring to you uh, two experts on voting rights, because there's no question that Dr. King particularly wanted to make sure that voting rights were absolutely imperative. You can see um, his incredible words, which I will read not with anywhere near, we should have had, uh, you know, Reverend Dr. Augustine read it because he could have read it with that good preaching. But uh, he said, let us march on ballot boxes so men and women will no longer walk the streets in search for jobs that do not exist. Let us march on ballot boxes until the empty stomachs of Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, and South Carolina are filled. Let us march on ballot boxes. I had a privilege myself to meet Dr. King when I was just a young, uh, a young child. I was 12 years old. Um, he came to Cleveland and he had been coming to Cleveland a number of times uh, in the context of Carl Stokes was running for mayor. And my parents were very involved in the civil rights movement as a result of their involvement in church. And so my mother was at a meeting and Dr. King said, I have been to every black church in Cleveland. I've never been invited to a white church. And she said, oh, well, you can come to mine. And so as is the time of those days, he said, okay, fine, I'll come. So she came back, told the church. And of course they made my father the chairman of the event uh, because men led in those things. And we have this incredible picture of my dad holding the microphone for Dr. King because what happened in our church is that the church split over the invitation and the committee that had been charged with filling, uh, updating the sanctuary decided that he couldn't possibly speak in the sanctuary because it was under construction. And my mother's something of a force of nature. So she said, fine, he'll speak outside. And they were like, what if it rains? She said, it won't rain. And he stood on the steps. And this little microphone was one of those bullhorn things that I don't think had worked before or since, but that day he spoke to a thousand people. So this is a continuing struggle that was also continued by John Lewis, uh, who was our Freedom Award winner about 10 years ago. And you listen to Congressman Lewis who said, my dear friends, your vote is precious, almost sacred. It is the most powerful nonviolent tool that we have to create a more perfect union. And so to tell us the history of our struggle for voting rights, Dr. Hassan Jeffries is a distinguished historian uh, who teaches at The Ohio State University, uh, uh, my home of Ohio, so we know about The Ohio State University. Born in Brooklyn, uh, summa cum laude from Morehouse uh, and his PhD from Duke University. We are so honored to have Dr. Jeffries here with us. Uh, and I could read you his bio, but I think it would be better if he told you the story. So let me just tell you two small things from his bio. He was the lead historian and primary script writer for the renovation of the National Civil Rights Museum in Memphis, Tennessee, the site of the assassination of Dr. King. And he hosts a podcast, Teaching Hard History, a production of the Southern Poverty Law Center's Educational Division on Teaching Tolerance, and has been extremely creative in his teaching where he's even taken small groups of undergraduates to James Madison's Montpelier, which is the Virginia plantation home of the nation's fourth president, 
to explore the history of race and racism in America. So Dr. Jeffries, would you like to share with us a historical perspective on the pursuit of a more perfect union? Well, absolutely. And thank you so much for the, for the introduction and for the bit of history. Uh, when you were talking about King coming to the family's church, that's absolutely amazing. And then the resistance that he received. We weren't talking about Cleveland, Mississippi. We were talking about Cleveland, Ohio. It exactly. Just some of those barriers that we have to recognize and acknowledge. So that's, that's this really, you just set it up wonderful um, for me. So thank you very much. So I'll take a few minutes um, and, and lay a little background. I'm going to share my screen. I have a few PowerPoint slides. Uh, and then I will hand it off to the good Reverend Dr. Uh, J. Augustine, uh, uh, close to the bottom of the, bottom of the so And I go. have a few things to say about Reverend Doctor as we move into him. So okay, so I'll hand it off back. I'll hand it back to you. you can uh, hand it back to me, and I'll, I'll I'll give his proper introduction. There we go. Wonderful, wonderful teamwork. <laughs> so voting rights uh, then and now, uh, really keying in on voting rights. Uh, because voting is is really the key to democracy, and it's the key to creating a more perfect union. I am a historian uh, by trade and by training, and so I want to begin with a little bit of history. In 1873, in Colfax, Louisiana, which is in Grant Parish, about an hour, uh, two hours from uh, New Orleans and about an hour from Baton Rouge, uh, in 1873, we were in the midst of Reconstruction. Reconstruction was declining in, in many states, but uh, Reconstruction was still going strong in the state of Louisiana. It was, uh, the state government was controlled by uh, Republicans, a, a coalition of black and white Republicans, uh, and many counties, including or parishes, including Grant Parish, uh, was controlled by Republicans as well, uh, black and white coalition. Uh, it was close, a, a thin, a thin margin uh, of victory uh, in 1872 and 1873 led to Republicans retaining control uh, based almost wholly on the vote of African Americans, uh, retaining control uh, of the county government. That did not sit well with former Confederates, those who uh, fought a war to uh, maintain the institution of slavery those who continue to believe that as Chief Justice Roger or Justice Roger Taney of the Supreme Court said in 1857 that uh, African-Americans had no rights which the white man was bound to respect uh, that carried over from slavery into freedom. Uh, the question including among those rights was this idea of the right to vote. And so the idea uh, that these uh, white men uh, would be governed uh, by a coalition that had been put into power uh, based upon black votes uh, was anathema to their existence. And so uh, a couple hundred formed a racial terror group patterned off of the Ku Klux Klan uh, called the Knights of the White Chameleon. And they sent word that they were going to very shortly in 18, April of 1873, going to march on the uh, parish courthouse and remove the duly elected sitting government because they did not believe that that government was legitimate because it was based on uh, black votes. Uh, African-Americans, former soldiers in the Union Army uh, in Louisiana got word of what was going to happen. Uh, they armed up and they went down to that parish courthouse to defend not just the, uh, uh, the courthouse, but to defend the principle of democracy. Uh, and, and, and defend it they did. Uh, on April 3rd uh, or thereabouts, uh, the white mob uh, armed with uh, guns, Confederate issue weapons, including a cannon, uh, showed up at the parish courthouse, opened fire in his exchange of, 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 of uh, arms, a, a volley of arms. Uh, three white men were killed. A couple African-Americans um, were injured, uh, but, at, but, the, but the brothers were outnumbered, outnumbered and outgunned. So they realized that their only exit, their only way to survive uh, was to surrender. But when they surrendered, that white mob on the outside shot every single standing African-American and then lynched those black men who were wounded 
and have remained inside the county courthouse. In total, about 150 African-American men were massacred that day, the Colfax massacre. Uh, the, the government uh, was then uh, usurped, uh, but there was a Republican uh, president, Ulysses S. Grant, who was cracking down on this kind of political violence, and he sent in federal troops, uh, regain control, arrest some 90 of the assailants, and about 10 or so uh, actually will stand trial and are convicted, but their convictions are overturned by the Supreme Court, uh, which at that point had been moving away from protecting African-American civil rights. Uh, and the Supreme Court said that the 14th Amendment, which they were being uh, tried on, uh, did not apply to individuals. It only applied to states. So no one uh, in the end actually served time uh, were, were held account for their actions. Now, why do I share this little bit of history, 1873? Because of the way in which it is remembered or rather misremembered. Uh, 150 African-Americans are slain, but we call this the Colfax massacre. We do a couple things when we look back at the past and this is relevant to voting rights. Uh, we, we, we suffer uh, as Americans from what I call historical amnesia. Uh, we pretend uh, that, th that certain things in the past just simply didn't happen. Uh, and so I, I have no doubt uh, that many who are on this uh, uh, Zoom call right now, I've never heard uh, about the Colfax massacre uh, because we just pretend that this kind of historical violence, political violence just did not happen. At the same time, uh, we also create false narratives. This is uh, the image in front of you right now is a historic marker erected by the Louisiana Department of Commerce and Industry uh, in 1950, just on the heels of the, of the public immersion of the civil rights movement, uh, the high point of public activism, but it had already been bubbling up. Uh, and note the false narrative. This wasn't a massacre in which 150 African-Americans were just blatantly killed, uh, told to drop their arms, come out, surrender, and then are murdered. This is a riot as though one of these race riots, as though African-Americans were somehow um, uh, responsible for the action. And uh, if you read on this side of Kerr Colfax riot, uh, in which three white men, 150 Negroes were slain, again, this narrative about, was this some type of uh, mutual conflict uh, uh, that we see being perpetuated in this, in this narrative? Uh, and then lastly, uh, this attempt to rationalize evil. These, uh, this was an evil act. Uh, of political violence that resulted in the death of 150 uh, men. Uh, but that second sentence, this event on April 13th, 1873, marked the end of carpetbag misrule in the South. This idea of reconstruction as somehow being uh, unconstitutional, inherently corrupt. This is trying to rationalize evil. We have this, this event took place in order to redeem the South. Right? That's rationalizing evil. There was an illegitimate government, and therefore uh, it was incumbent upon the good citizens, the good white citizens, the good white male citizens of Louisiana, of Colfax and Grant Parish, to take it upon themselves uh, to right this wrong. This is the kind of hard history, this, this, this massacre that we don't deal with uh, in, in a fair and honest way. And you say, well, that's unfortunate, right? Dealing, you know, we, we need to do better about dealing with the past. Well, the part that's really unfortunate is because we respond to hard history in this particular way, we're not in a place to deal with incidents uh, like what we saw on January 6th with this insurrection at the US Capitol. And just think about what I had just said about how we respond to this history. It, you know, this was a, a shocking event. Uh, and we had never seen this before in U.S. history, a storming uh, of the U.S. Capitol. But we ought not be surprised by it, one, because of the local tenor and tone of uh, politics in the moment, particularly coming from the right side of the political spectrum, but also because of this longer history of political violence. America has a tradition of political violence, uh, particularly as it relates to African-American voting rights. Be just as we saw with Colfax, the reason why uh, those white men uh, uh, um, uh, stormed uh, that, that, that parish courthouse is because they believed that the election that led to Republicans at the time controlling the leverage of power was illegitimate because African-Americans had cast ballots in this election. That is no different uh, than the rationalization, than the motivation 
that we saw for the storming of the Capitol uh, just the other day, uh, because the critique offered by then President uh, Donald Trump, literally before all the ballots were counted, uh, was that this, this election was illegitimate, it was stolen, uh, not in the suburbs of America, not in rural America, but in the tradition of race and racism in America, it was stolen by black ballots. Milwaukee was the problem. Uh, Detroit was the problem. Atlanta, Georgia was the problem. Philadelphia was the problem. Black voters were the problem. That same belief uh, that Roger Tawney articulated in 1857 uh, remains uh, current in the minds of far too many people. This idea that African-Americans have no rights and certainly no voting rights that a white man is bound to respect leads to this assault on the nation's capital. So uh, in the 10 minutes or so that I have left, what should we do? Well, the first thing is we have to look back to the past and be clear about our American political traditions. Uh, we have to start at the beginning. Uh, 1776, a lot of people talk about 1776 apparently, but they ain't getting 1776 right. Uh, when we think about, uh, as, as Jane had pointed out, I've had this wonderful opportunity of taking students uh, from Ohio State down to James Madison's Montpelier. And the reason why I've been taking the students there is because I want them to spend a little time in Madison's library, which is literally the room where he conceived and conceptualized the Bill of Rights. Uh, but then I also want to take them downstairs into the cellars to spend a little time in the cellars where the enslaved African-Americans spent their time. Madison was the fourth president of the United States, but he was also an enslaver, a fourth generation, a third generation enslaver. This was the family business. This wasn't some side gig, some side hustle. This defined his experience. So we have an enslaver, a third generation enslaver defining democracy for America. But I also want our students to come down into this basement and to lay their hands on the brick walls of the basement. And if you look at that uh, if you, for those who are on video, if you can see that center brick and these impressions in the brick, those are actually the fingerprints of the enslaved people who made those bricks. The bricks uh, on Madison's plantation were all made by the enslaved people who lived and were forced to work there. But when you lay your hands on those bricks, you'll notice something. You'll notice that they are actually too small to be an adult's hand print because they're not. Uh, they are actually the handprints of children because it was enslaved children uh, who were forced to make the bricks uh, for Madison's comfort and convenience. And so when we're beginning this journey on voting rights and understanding voting rights then and now, it begins with this moment of defining democracy. And it's critical that we understand that the, the foundation uh, for this nation as it relates uh, to voting rights and, and, and basically our basic civil rights rests uh, on a bed of bricks on a foundation of bricks made by enslaved children. The, we, this is our starting point. This isn't you know, just sort of America's original sin. This is our origin. And so we have to understand that the, the fight, the quest for a more perfect union uh, you know, starts for some people uh, in one place and for other people in a different place. And African-Americans have been trying to play catch up uh, this, whole, this whole time. As we, as we move forward, for the first, um, uh, you know, until 1865, African-Americans are fighting for a literal freedom. You have a, you have a number of uh, 700,000 free African-Americans, and in some places they're able to vote, other places uh, they are not. Here in Columbus, here in Ohio, Ohio comes in as a free state, and my students get really excited when, they, when I ask them, tell me about Ohio, and they say, oh, Ohio came in as a free state, it was opposed to slavery. And I said, yeah, but do you know why? It was opposed to slavery because they didn't want the, 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 the white uh, constitutional, the, the, the white founders of this state did not want uh, black people in the state. So you know, it, they, they believed in white supremacy too. Uh, they're on the right side of history, but for the wrong reasons. And so it's not really until we get to the 15th Amendment uh, in 1870 that African-American men have the right to vote. And Frederick Douglass, the abolitionist uh, and former enslaved person himself said in 1865, uh, that freedom is meaningless without the vote. Uh, and so African-Americans rally, African-American men rally and secure this vote and they cast ballots. That's why you have the Colfax massacre uh, because black folk understood the power of the vote and they cast these ballots. But then soon afterward, uh, we talk about reconstruction only lasts a handful of years, not even a dozen years. In most places, you begin to see a rollback. 
because white Southerners in particular never agreed, never believed that African-Americans should participate in the political process. So we see starting in 1890 uh, to 1910, every state in the former Confederacy rewrites its state constitutions for the sole purpose of eliminating African-Americans from the political process. And they do so because of the fourth, because the 14th Amendment is on the books and says that states cannot discriminate against citizens. They do so in colorblind language. And so we can't be uh, uh, fall into the colorblind trap that just because something uh, does not explicitly say race does not mean that it is not intentionally designed to discriminate against people based upon race. And so for uh, practically a century, African-Americans are engaged in this struggle uh, to secure voting rights, uh, but they're not interested uh, in simply replicating uh, the undemocratic political tradition of so many places, the undemocratic political tradition of America, when they're fighting for uh, their voting rights, they're fighting for what I call freedom rights. And this is an image from my first book uh, in Lowndes County, Alabama, a place in the heart of Alabama between Selma and Montgomery that is 80% African-American at the start of, and at the start of 18, 1965, 80% African-American has zero registered voters. But, the, but by the end of the next year, 5,122 African-Americans are eligible to vote. None are registered. And that's because of violence, right? The political disenfranchisement uh, enforced by violence. Uh, but by the end of the next year, not only have they created their, uh, re registered a majority of African-Americans vote, they've also created their own independent political party, the Lowndes County Freedom Organization, because the pursuit of the ballot was not, uh, and as, uh, that was not the end goal. It was, what are you gonna do with the ballot uh, once you have it in hand. And so when we get to the Voting Rights Act, and here's an image of Dr. King and Lyndon Johnson at that signing uh, in August of 1965, we look at the Voting Rights Act and, and many times we think, oh, this is the end of the movement. Like, no, it's not the end, it's a transition to a new phase. Now that you have the vote, what are you gonna do with it? It was always about putting the ballot in black folks' hands so that they could have a, a say in the decisions that impacted their lives. And the Voting Rights, Act's pro pro provide, Voting Rights Act provides these additional protections uh, to secure African-American voting rights. And then uh, what we see in this critical moment, this is important because connected directly to the Voting Rights Act is a realignment of the major political parties. Uh, and that realignment where former segregationists, pro-segregationists wind up leaving the Democratic Party uh, because of their uh, distaste and dislike uh, for the um, pro-civil rights platform of the National Democratic Party. And they are, are embraced, uh, welcomed into the Republican Party. And so by the time we get to 1980 and you get the conservative ascendancy with Ronald Reagan, uh, he is literally playing uh, to the racism of, of, of the former Democratic base, now the Republican base. And it is not a surprise, and this is important to point out, that in 1980, when he announces uh, his election, uh, his run for president of the United States, he does not do it former governor of California in California. He does not do it in Washington, DC. He does not do it in a major metropolitan area. He goes to Neshoba County, Mississippi. Neshoba County, Mississippi. Ain't nothing in Neshoba County, Mississippi, but a little bit of history. And that little bit of history is that in Philadelphia, Mississippi, uh, in, in 1964, three civil rights workers were murdered, fighting for the voting rights of, of African-Americans, helping to organize the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. This new conservatism is rooted on an effort to disenfranchise and keep the ballot away from African-Americans. And we just have to be honest and fair about that. And so we see that during the 80s, during these conservative administrations, this effort to roll back African-American voting rights. Now, as we fast forward into the current moment, this is not so much a question of uh, the wholesale exclusion of African-Americans from the ballot box as we once saw with the wave of disenfranchisement constitutions uh, in the 1890s and early 1900s, because you no longer need to do that. You no longer need wholesale disenfranchisement. All you actually need to do is make it difficult uh, for a small percentage of African-Americans, a small percentage of people of color to, part, to cast ballots, and that's enough to win uh, a national election. You just think about this last election, Georgia, uh, it, it's, it's 11,000. Apparently, we know the exact number, right? 11,780 uh, uh, votes. Uh, 
right, is the difference between uh, you know who's going to sit in the White House and who and who's who's going to be sitting in the outhouse. Uh, and so you don't need to disenfranchise whole numbers, uh, masses of people anymore. Uh, it's just about picking off a hand few. That's why we see, and it is so uh, uh, devastating uh, to to voting rights today. This effort to make it more difficult uh, to cast ballots in elections. Uh, with voter IDs. I mean, we've, we've over the last 10 years, and I'm about to hand it off now, the last word, over the last 10, 15 years, we've made it more difficult uh, for people to participate in the political process. That's not what we should be doing in a democracy. We should be making it easier for people to participate in the political process. But we have half of the country wrapped up in this lie that voter fraud and voter impersonation exists. It doesn't exist. America does not have a voting fraud problem. America has a voting problem. Americans don't vote. Percentage-wise, we don't vote. Uh, so we need to reorient uh, how we think about the voting, uh, how we think about voting in the past as well as in the present. And we need to be doing the things to expand the electorate. No matter where people may fall on the political spectrum, you want in a healthy democracy, you want as many people to participate in the political process as possible. So I end uh, and, and pass the baton with this last word with King's final statement, his final book. Uh, which was entitled, Where Do We Go From Here? Chaos or Community? C community, And I think that is the question that we have to wrestle with going forward. Where do we go from here? Thank you very much. Whoa, Dr. Jeffries, that was incredible history lesson. And, you know, yes, it's hard history, but it's important history and we've got to learn from our history. Yeah. So we now turn to a man who can talk to us about the beloved community. Uh, the Reverend Dr. J. Augustine uh, is, comes to us both as a minister and as an attorney. Um, if you were to go through his background, much like yours, Dr. Jeffries, um, I would be taking up all the time telling stories. But let me just give a little bit of perspective. Uh, the Reverend Dr. Augustine, serves as of as counsel with the Southern Coalition for Social Justice. And he is the author of a book called The Keys Are Being Passed, Race, Law, Religion, and the Legacy of the Civil Rights Movement. His life has been a piece of the legacy. Um, he's from Louisiana. Uh, you know, we, we got to you know, have a little go Tigers there. Um, <laughs> even though I know, you know, we got a Howard man, a Morehouse man, and two gentlemen from Duke. What can we say? Club 1867. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, exactly, exactly. But, but let us say uh, one of the most interesting uh, pieces of, of his background, I sort of pick out a little piece, is that Reverend Dr. Augustine successfully represented a class of plaintiffs in Carter versus St. Helena Parish School Board, which is one of the oldest school desegregation cases that was originally filed by Thurgood Marshall. So the history of trying to secure the rights for the African-American people in this country is something that continues from generation to generation. So Reverend Dr. Augustine, Dr. Jeffries has set the stage. We are in a continuing conversation about how do we reach that more perfect union. Tell us your perspective. Thank you, Jane. Let me first say thank you so much to you and Sam uh, for having me to be a part of this conversation. <clears throat> thank you to my colleague, Dr. Jeffries, uh, for allowing me to share this moment with you. Uh, Dr. Jeffries has given us a wonderful historical analysis and several things that I will share will have somewhat of an overlap. Uh, but my research and my, my cognitive approach is from an interdisciplinary perspective where I want to look at history through the eyes of faith and how faith motivated things, particularly the civil rights movement and passage of the Voting Rights Act, uh, because Dr. King, above all, was an ordained minister. So the presentation I'd like to share with you is his dream is marching on faith communities and the Voting Rights Act in citizen participation. Dr. King's dream was really for an egalitarian society where all people, regardless of who you are, could participate, especially in voting. 
I would argue that the civil rights movement's most empirical measure of success, if we were to measure it, if we were to quantify how did it change things for the better, <clears throat> how did it change citizen participation for the better, unquestionably, the Voting Rights Act of 1965 was the benchmark or it set the high watermark. Now, King ended his most famous oration, the most famous oration of the 20th century, the I Have a Dream speech, with a reference to the battle hymn of the Republic. He said, uh, uh, glory, glory, hallelujah. Uh, uh, he said, my eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. I want to title this presentation, I have titled this presentation with a similar paraphrase from the battle hymn of the Republic to say his dream is marching on. Dr. King's dream is marching on. By way of an outline, what I'd like to do is frame the context for uh, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, why it was so important, some of the historical foundations that undergirded it, some of the obstacles that stood in its way, uh, uh, the role faith leaders played in advancing opportunity, and that opportunity that came hand in hand uh, with the right to vote. When we talk about faith leaders being engaged, there really is a parallel. We have seen a level of activism in the church in the, in the Reconstruction era. We saw a similar level of activism in the civil rights movement, and we had not seen that level of activism until there was a response to what I will call the Make America Great Again narrative. There is a certain theology behind a, a, a church engagement in secular affairs, and that theology motivated Dr. King. So I wanna talk a little bit about what that theology was in terms of ministers being engaged in a fight for opportunity. At the same time, we'll connect the past and the present. And I suppose just like Dr. Jeffrey's great minds think alike when you were in Club 1867, I wanna ask the proverbial question, where do we go from here? And then of course, leave a little time for questions and answers. Next slide, please. Now here is powerful imagery when we talk about the Voting Rights Act. Don King used to have the famous expression, only in America. Only in America could a class of individuals who were relegated to a state that's depicted in the picture on the left rise in representation to be to, to, to uh, depict the picture on the right. Only in America, and this is directly a result of the Voting Rights Act. Next slide, please. When we talk about our history, one that is filled with both obstacles and opportunities, as you all have uh, a paid tribute to John Lewis, you see a young John Lewis as an activist with SNCC marching in Selma, Alabama across the Edmund Pettus Bridge, dealing with the obstacles that were Jim Crow and the obstacles uh, of how many bars were in a, how many bubbles rather in a bar of soap, uh, the obstacles to full citizen participation. And he engaged here in an act of peaceful resistance uh, on Bloody Sunday, or what became known as Bloody Sunday, March the 7th, 1965. Now, in as much as the pictures on the left, or the picture rather on the left represents obstacles, the picture on the right is about opportunity. This is August the 6th, 1965, after President Johnson signed the Voting Rights Act into law, and he obviously is passing out the, uh, uh, the pins that go along with the signing here, and Dr. King is receiving one. So the Voting Rights Act created tremendous opportunity for a more perfect union and for an inclusive society. Next slide, please. The United States has a history, obviously, that's been filled with obstacles and opportunities. But in this presentation, I wanna overview particularly how faith leaders have been a part of both the problem and the solution, but how faith has undergirded the body politic. Next slide, please. When we think about history, the Reconstruction era created opportunities. The Reconstruction era led uh, with passage of the 15th Amendment. In theory, at least, it guaranteed the right to vote to those who were previously enslaved. The picture on the left is Hiram Revels. I'm proud to share a US Senator from Mississippi, but one who served in the denomination in which I'm ordained and served in the African Methodist Episcopal Church. There, of course, was backlash that was created. Some people call it blacklash, created as a result of those opportunities. The backlash came in the form of a group known as the Ku Klux Klan, the White Citizens Council that was engaged uh, to inflict terror on individuals because they were exercising the franchise during the period we popularly know as Reconstruction. Next slide, please. So the 15th Amendment is expressed. The right of citizens to vote shall not be denied on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. 
It was during Reconstruction that the Black church really flourished, I would argue, because of its activism. And again, we have not seen, or we did not see that level of activism again until the civil rights era, where Dr. King ushered in a, a, a political engagement with the church. Uh, and and we, we, we really went dormant. The church was dormant for quite a while, I believe, with respect to political engagement. But it woke up. It did. A, it woke up from a Rip Van Winkle during the uh, in response to the Trump era or in response to the Make America Great Again narrative. where we were very deliberate in attempting to set rights back. Uh, but that's just when you see the rise, obviously, of the Ku Klux Klan uh, in post Reconstruction in a period that was popularly called the area of redemption, where where whites felt a need to redeem themselves in response to Reconstruction. Next slide, please. So after Reconstruction, well, we move into redemption. Uh, uh, that ushered in an era that led to Jim Crow. Now, the picture on the left is from my hometown, New Orleans. Lee Circle, as in Robert E. Lee, and the, 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 the uh, picture there is of uh, Lee at the top of a, of a, a pedestal. Um, during this period of redemption, around the country. I, I picked the picture here from New Orleans because I'm from New Orleans, but around the country, uh, we saw the rise of monuments put in place in very public domain uh, to remind everyone of who was in charge and remind everyone of the rightful owners of this land that we call home of the free. This was largely put up, these statutes was largely put up as reminders during this period of redemption. Uh, and redemption then led into a period where black rights were inferior uh, 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 during a period we know as Jim Crow. Next slide, please. This, I want to say, is very special to me. Um, I am a, I'm an interdisciplinary scholar. I'm someone who has uh, been at the law school. I've been at the divinity school. Um, uh, I'm also ordained in the AME church, as I referenced. There is, a, there is a popular debate among scholars about when the civil rights movement began. Some would say that the picture on the left shows Oliver Brown with his daughter Linda there. It began uh, with the filing of Brown v. Board of Education. And obviously the case was decided uh, May the 17th, 1954, a case that was argued, of course, by Thurgood Marshall uh, before the United States Supreme Court. Others would say that the civil rights movement began uh, really with Dr. King with great oratory, uh, not quite a year into his pastorate uh, at Dexter Avenue Church down in, um, down in Alabama. Uh, and here in Montgomery, and here he meets Rosa Parks, who's very active with the NAACP. I might add a very active member of St. Paul's AME Church there in Montgomery. Uh, some would say it began with the Montgomery bus boycott uh, on December 1st, 1955. Regardless of which school of thought one subscribes to, the movement began with faith leaders. The movement was undergirded by faith, and it's a reason faith leaders put themselves on the line to make communal change. And that's really, really where I want to go and focus for the duration of my time. Next slide, please. So the question becomes why? Why would one put themselves, why would one put their physical body in harm's way? From Isaiah 53, it really provides a core theology that undergirded the civil rights movement and the fight for voting rights. Dr. King wrote an essay in the Christian Century Magazine uh, where he said, suffering is redemptive. And let me give a brief quote from Isaiah 53 verses one through six from the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed, for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole. And by his bruises, we are healed. Some obviously in a Christocentric context would argue that this scripture is messianic and this scripture, this scripture speaks to the one who was foretold uh, of Christ who would come and suffer for human redemption. That certainly is a very valid Christian read of a Jewish scripture. Regardless of how one reads it, however, the theology that undergirded the movement was that suffering, when it's not about oneself, when it's not merited, when it's not in response to something you have done, but suffering that is unmerited is redemptive because it's considered suffering for a greater cause. I would add that that same rationale, though not to the same religious extent, but that same rationale of being willing to sacrifice one's personal body is what has undergirded uh, contemporary activists like the Black Lives Matter movement in response to the horrific killings we saw of African-Americans 
uh, during 2020 and obviously before. Uh, next slide, please. Now, here is a little bit more about why faith leaders would get involved. Uh, the cross, the Christian cross, has two planes. In Dr. King's first book, Stride Toward Freedom, the Montgomery story, he wrote about the vertical axis of the cross or the vertical plane as well as the horizontal plane. The salvific aspect of Christianity, uh, uh, one is saved, one is reconciled in relationship with God is represented by the vertical plane of the cross. But King also writes about that horizontal plane of the cross because the church cannot just deal with salvation in the kingdom to come, the church has also got to deal with social injustices and social inequities in the kingdom at hand. So this imagery of the cross that Dr. King really describes well in Stride Toward Freedom is something that shows why it was imperative for faith leaders to be involved in fights for equal justice, particularly in a fight for the right to vote. Next slide, please. So how does that suffering, how does that suffering being redemptive, how does that theology play out in the uh, in American history, uh, fighting for opportunities. On the left, we see young people doing lunch counter sit-ins. Uh, here again, knowing that they were putting themselves in harm's way, but it wasn't about them because suffering was redemptive. We really saw this philosophy, and I say this theology play out in 1961 with the Freedom Rise. This is when we received threats. We knew buses would be firebombed, but we truly believed that discrimination in interstate commerce was wrong. So it was, was certainly worth putting one's physical self in harm's way in riding buses uh, to test discriminatory laws in interstate commerce. Heading, I might add, the ultimate destination of the Freedom Rides was uh, downtown New Orleans at the uh, Greyhound Trailway Station. Next slide, please. So again, here is John Lewis that you honored on his knees to the left. Uh, uh, the right to vote created opportunity. The right to vote means uh, everyone can participate fairly in society. Uh, this theology undergirded them on Bloody Sunday, March the 7th, 1965. I might add on that morning, uh, they met at Brown Chapel AME Church. They prayed. They sang together, they motivated one another, and they were undergirded by faith. Again, that suffering is redemptive. And because of that belief that suffering is redemptive, because it's not about the individual, but it's about the whole, the Voting Rights Act became law on August the 6th, 1965. And the result of that is what I will call free and fair elections. And I certainly want to revisit that phrase uh, very soon, free and fair elections. Next slide, please. So every action has a reaction in response to the civil rights movement's success, especially uh, the Voting Rights Act of 1965. There was a Southern strategy that came about, and this led to a law and order campaign based on an anti-progressive sentiment. Some will say an anti-racial sentiment or a very racialized sentiment against progressive politics uh, that were led by African-Americans. This was largely the Nixon administration that was speaking to what some will call the silent majority, right? The strategy worked. Southern working class whites became a core constituency of a particular political party, of the Republican Party, and at the same time, faith leaders, Jerry Falwell here, who was a very conservative evangelical, founded the moral majority to oppose mandated integration in Christian schools. This began lines of political division, largely associated with faith, obviously in response to what faith brought about uh, with respect to the Voting Rights Act. Next slide, please. What does that mean? How has that played out? My goodness gracious. That means the majority of evangelical voters, the majority of white evangelical voters in particular have self-identified with a particular party for, for almost 40 years, or more than 40 years. What President Reagan attempted to usher in with respect to the silent majority, the Southern uh, strategy really came to fruition. Uh, that, that famous speech that Dr. Jeffries referenced that Reagan began uh, a presidential campaign the, uh, the mantra there, it, it's, it's what we've heard in the 2016 election was really a throwback, if you will. Make America great again was the tagline that President Reagan used in campaigning down in Philadelphia, Mississippi. So this, this long term, or the long term results rather, show that evangelicals here overwhelmingly have supported Republicans 
uh, for more than 40 years and look at the numbers on how white evangelicals supported Donald Trump over Hillary Clinton in the 2016 election. I don't wanna make this about partisanship. I'm only making this about facts and about how, uh, how history uh, uh, has shown faith and politics pairing together. Next slide, please. Um, Dr. Jeffries talked a little bit about the violence that we have seen that has been so intimately associated with the narrative of America. Uh, if you will remember August uh, 2017, the violence that went on in Charlottesville, Virginia, how did the, the then president respond? Well, there were very fine people on both sides. I mentioned that the church had been dormant. The church had done a Rip Van Winkle. I will own that. We had not seen the level of activism that we saw in response to this, and in in obviously the years that succeeded this, but as in response overall to the Make America Great Again narrative, we had not seen that level of activism in the church since the civil rights movement. And prior to that, again, we had not seen that level of activism since Reconstruction. But the church responded. In the slide on the right there, you will see some faith leaders who are very concerned about the body politic and a variety of issues that are associated with equality and equal participation in America, particularly the Voting Rights Act. Next slide, please. I want to let this image on the left just sit for a moment because it says so much. Now, if Dr. King's dream was about free and fair elections, consider what happened in the 2020 Georgia Senate races, plural. Consider when, when uh, Philadelphia, Mississippi rose to prominence in 1964, it's because Cheney, Goodman, and Schwerner, the civil rights workers, were murdered there. Uh, that means Blacks and Jews were, were considered to be in opposition with uh, the majority of Americans. But in Georgia, because there was a free and fair election because of the Voting Rights Act in 2020, Georgia elected a Jewish member of the United States Senate and an African-American member of the United States Senate. Free and fair elections. I want you to also consider the comments that were made by the Georgia Secretary of State and others about the legitimacy of the elections. There is, there is we've seen in the press, uh, uh, allegedly members of the United States Senate from other states calling, can you please get him some votes? We've seen uh, allegations that the president called in. I need to get some votes. But the Secretary of State, who is a Republican, said this election has been fair. Let's be clear. These are not my candidates. These are not the candidates I wanted to win. But this election is legitimate. This election has been fair. That is only because of the Voting Rights Act. Next slide, please. What does that enthusiasm mean? That enthusiasm means that the 2020 elections have resulted now in the first African-American woman serving as presiding officer of the United States Senate, as vice president of these United States of America. What message does that send to women? What message does that send to minorities? People are engaged, people are exciting, and his dream is marching on. But the question is, however, as I prepare to close, next slide, please. Where do we go from here? Dr. King asked that question, and where do we go from here after all of the excitement and enthusiasm about voting? Does the future of citizen participation mean people will be engaged for redistricting the next fights on the horizon? Does the future of citizen participation mean that there'll be some sort of element of reconciliation after all the racial hostilities we had in 2020? Where do we go from here? Next slide, and the final one. By way of review, we have talked about those two planes of the cross. We've discussed obstacles and opportunities to the Voting Rights Act. We've discussed how faith communities have led the fight for fair citizen participation and how that mattered so much in the 2020 elections. But I really want to leave you with the question, where do we go from here? What does that mean for the future of citizen participation? Is his truth or is his dream really marching on? Jane, thank you so much for the opportunity to participate. It really, really has been my pleasure. Well, Re Reverend, o Reverend Augustine, you give us another history lesson with the faith community. And now we're going to spend these last few minutes talking about where the answer in that question that you both asked, where do we go from here? A couple of our listeners have written in a couple, two, two questions, and I want, you know, you to sort of tag team on these. Um, one is, 
given the fact that it is the responsibility of the states to manage the elections, we saw that as we saw the different state officials responding. Um, do you have any thoughts about what should be in the Voting Rights? Do we need a new Voting Rights Act? Um, what, what's the status um, as we look forward on a legislative matter? And then a related question, should we look at Australia, which requires that everybody votes? And what would, what would be the impact if we just simply said, you must vote? So maybe Dr. Jeffries, why don't you take a first crack at Yeah, know. absolutely. Uh, I'll take a, a stab at the, the second question first. I think we should absolutely uh, make it mandatory uh, that people vote. Uh, again, we don't have a voter fraud problem. We, our problem is not enough of us vote. We don't take it seriously enough. Uh, our, our voter percentages, our participation levels are some of the lowest among comparable, comparable nations when you look at demographics and industry and economy and the like. So I think there's no harm in following models that actually work until we get to the point uh, where we have, uh, uh, I lost my video, but until we get to, can you still hear me? Yes. We can okay. hear you, yep. Okay, okay, I don't wanna mess with the video. You know, just, uh, until we get to the point uh, where we get those numbers higher, uh, then we should absolutely uh, consider uh, making mandatory uh, the uh, uh, voting. Uh, and, and then in addition to that, thinking about the Voting Rights Act, uh, rather than uh, robbing it of its teeth, uh, we should be thinking about ways to expand it. So it applies not just to those initial states uh, through that early formula that uh, the Chief Justice said no longer applied, but uh, looking at uh, states outside of the Deep South, uh, where we see patterns, consistent patterns and practices of discriminatory treatment when it comes to uh, voter regu regulation. Um, I will respond to the first part of the question by sharing I am optimistic, uh, both legislatively and judicially, uh, that the, the, the desire for the dream to march on uh, will come to pass with protections for the Voting Rights Act. Uh, number one, I'm hopeful from a, from a legislative perspective that Congress will pass uh, I'm going to call it the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. I'm going I'm to make it uh, put the protections that are in place that are normally renewed every 25 years uh, from the Voting Rights Act as it currently stands, make those permanent, make those permanent protections so we don't have to come forward and lobby for them uh, every 25 years. Um, I'm also optimistic. I just worked on a on an amicus curiae brief or an amicus curiae brief with the Southern Coalition um, on the, uh, uh, the Bronovich case which is going before the Supreme Court. Um, the portion which I was most concerned about deals with out of precinct voting and the ability uh, for people to vote out of precinct and have their, it would be the, the, the federal elections or local elections, municipal elections counted, uh, mayoral elections counted and so forth in a, 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 even though they voted in a, in a precinct in which they are not registered. Why does that matter so much? It disproportionately affects African-Americans. When you talk about the protections of Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act, uh, it eliminates discrimination based on race and voting, but discrimination can be both express and implied. It can be both on its face or it can be as applied. Uh, so a discrimination that says blacks cannot vote, obviously that's, that's on its face, but one that is applied when you talk about the social, cultural, and the, and the socioeconomic circumstances that lead so many blacks uh, 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 that, that, that that don't allow them to vote, that statistics and literature show time and time again, they, they, it's, it's so difficult for them to vote. There's so many impediments for them voting in the normal precinct, allowing out of precinct voting, uh, uh, really as Dr. Jeffries made the point well, it really can make a difference with elections in a tremendous fashion. So I'm optimistic that both the legislature and the courts uh, will go in a way that will protect the right to vote for all. And a couple people have asked this question. How do you think we build the bipartisan uh, affirmation for voting rights? Well, you know, I, th I think one of the things that we have to do is we got to start with truth. Uh, we can't build bipartisan support uh, for expanding the electorate if, if one part of that relationship is not interested in expanding the electorate. 
Uh, that is, I mean, I, I don't, I don't really see a way around that uh, because if if one party in particular is doing everything that it can to make it more difficult for people to vote, I mean, because that's that's antithetical to the very idea of the protections that were built into the Voting Rights Act that African Americans and so many others fought for. It, it, you 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 make such a fine point from a from a partisan perspective. I think. Uh, history shows clearly that that one party really thrives when fewer people vote. I think, however, as I revert back to the the way my presentation ended, in the enthusiasm that resulted from the 2020 elections, there was so much enthusiasm about voting because people had enough. I would hope that people now have experienced a dark side that we had not experienced in a generation. I would hope we would never have to go to a point where people would not want to vote in record numbers again. I hope people will continue to want to be engaged and participate fully in society. And that means coming up in the very near future, obviously redistricting, that means midterm elections, that means the next presidential election, that means municipal elections. I hope people will continue with the enthusiasm that we saw in 2020. Maybe Dr. Augustine, this one's for you. Um, the Colfax uh, massacre that Dr. Jeffries led off with took place on Easter Sunday. Mm -hmm. um, was there any reaction from the churches at that time? And is that in any way commemorated with the churches? Uh, yes, and unfortunately so. There is a, there is a rich history uh, behind what is often called the religion of a lost cause. Uh, and this is this is large in part the, the quote Dr. Jeffries referenced. Uh, 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 there are no rights from blacks that we have to respect that whites are bound to respect. This was largely fueled uh, by white segregationists, white supremacists uh, that were heavily associated with the church. Uh, uh, there is a great read I would recommend for you uh, called White Too Long. Um, uh, uh, Robert, a uh, um, uh, great read, the, the, the president of the PRRI, the Public Research uh, Institute, uh, in D.C., a uh, uh, great read that really talks about how segregation is and the church's influence. So there is there is absolutely no coincidence that something like that would have occurred on uh, uh, on Easter Sunday. Uh, that is one example. We've, there, there are other examples that have occurred in Georgia and Mississippi on similar religious holidays, because these were times when the church would rally behind what they considered to be the purity of white religion. So there absolutely is no uh, no coincidence there. I will say that in response to things like that, uh, again, during Reconstruction, which was prior to that incident, but during Reconstruction, we saw a rise in activism and political activism uh, uh, in the uh, in the African American churches. And if you parallel that with the civil rights movement in response to injustice, we saw a rise in political activism again with progressive churches. And we saw that same sort of rise here in response to the Make America Great Again narrative over the course of the last four years. We could keep this conversation going on for another hour, but we would uh, not be respectful of people's time. So let us let us have one final uh, final question and use it as a wrap up. Both of you spoke about when we talk about go where do we go from here about redistricting. Um, would you like to give our listeners some thoughts about? What are the special challenges in making the redistricting process transparent, open, fair, and how can they as citizens and uh, people who care deeply about democracy engage and participate? Please be engaged at your state legislature. Hmm. Uh, the fight for redistricting in some regards or in many regards is forthcoming because it has not yet occurred. Uh, but the rules for redistricting in many regards are already set because the players in the respective state legislatures are there. Uh, and again, as, as was highlighted, there is one party that benefits or that has shown it historically benefits from less people being engaged than more people being engaged. So I would say more than anything, as we go forward, please to your listeners, them and I ask them to encourage others, be vigilant, be active, be participatory, uh, uh, speak out be engaged in the redistricting process because the, the detrimental effects of it will last for at least 10 years. And I, I would just second, I would second those remarks. I mean, part of being engaged also means demanding 
transparency because far too often the uh, the committees, the bodies uh, that determine the district lines uh, will do so behind closed doors. Uh, and so the every state has its own procedures, uh, but usually it defaults to the uh, party in power, the state legislature, uh, whatever group is in power. Uh, and you have to demand uh, as citizens that the decision making, the map drawing, the lines that are drawn be done openly, uh, be done transparently, and be done with the input of people so that it is done fair. Too often, whether it's Republican or Democrat, uh, the, the team, the, the party in power draws lines to favor itself, and no one benefits from that. We do live and suffer with it. So we have to demand that openness, that fairness, but the only way that we will get it is if we also have transparency. Words to the wise. Now I'll tell you, I served in the Ohio legislature and I served during redistricting. And I will, I will tell you that the kind of ways that you can participate to get your legislator to pay attention is partly about things that make perfect sense to people once you say, like, why can't communities be kept together? Some of the redistricting maps had like small communities separated in three different legislative districts, three different congressional districts. Um, you had bizarre little lines to try to connect people through the median strip. And this is something that people could, so it's trying to talk to people in a public manner in ways that just make perfect sense because if you just say, we're gonna talk about the lines, people's eyes grow is over and what we have to do is be ready to move forward. Thank you both. Thank you for your time. Thank you for sharing your talent. Um, we are having such an incredible series. This is now, uh, we're now a couple months into our six month series that we've called Toward a More Perfect Union, which is designed to tell the story of how we have continued to strive for that more perfect union, both when it moved forward and when it moved backward and what were the uh, back and forths. Um, and the most fascinating thing about this country is that, you know, just as Dr. Jeffrey showed that picture of President Madison, who had slaves living in his basement, in, didn't comprehend that having enslaved people and having a Bill of Rights had any conflict yet and still. The founding fathers, white guys all, guys all, some who thought it was okay to own people, wrote a document that we can still use to strive toward justice. And that is what we're doing next week. Uh, our session is gonna have a distinguished scholar from the University of Connecticut, uh, Manisha Sina, who is gonna be talking about the lasting impact of slavery. Uh, so join us next Thursday. Um, if you want a fun uh, conversation about dialogues in democracy, uh, we are co-sponsoring with American University, Cory Booker, uh, tomorrow night at six o'clock. And if you know Senator Booker at all, he certainly is an engaging speaker and talks about these issues as we deal with it every day as a member of the United States Senate. I would be in big trouble if I didn't remind everybody that these dialogues are only available because of the members and supporters of the United States Capitol Historical Society. Thank you for your contributions. Thank you for your support. We look forward to uh, sharing with you. This recording will be available, uh, be available through our website. You're happy to look at it, share it. Uh, we welcome your participation. Dr. Augustine, Dr. Jeffries, thank you. We really appreciate your, your wisdom and the challenge for the age. Thank you for uh, having us. Thank you so much. Thank you.